What is going on, everybody? Welcome into our next NFL Draft Grades video. We're going to get right into it. I got to get this recording done before our roofers show up to get our new roof done and uh, start banging on everything. So let's go ahead and dive in. Please do hit that like button. Let me know your draft grades and reactions to all these picks in the comments down below. And here we go with the AFC North beginning with the Baltimore Ravens. So this is a draft that's going to get a ton of praise from a lot of people because this is definitely a consensus board darling of a draft, which the Ravens do often do that. They take a lot of players that a lot of people like, and it, it, it's not that I don't like this draft. I think it's a good draft. I just don't think this is an incredible, unbelievable draft. I'm probably going to have some knocks on it that a lot of other people don't because there's some players here that I was actually lower on than consensus. So it'll be an interesting one to follow in a couple of years. But again, a draft I like, and that especially starts at the top. I love that they took Nate Wiggins. After that tackle run happens, I much prefer they go that route than maybe do like what a Dallas did and kind of reach for need on a project tackle. No, you have a true first round cornerback prospect sitting there right in your lap. Falls a little bit because of some durability concerns. But if not for those concerns, I do think Nate Wiggins would have finished as my number one cornerback in this class. You know, before he ran a 4-2-8, I loved his film. I loved how fluid of an athlete he was, how sticky he was in coverage. I thought he liked to come up and hit, even though he was a slender player and it didn't always have that stopping power. Or sometimes he can get stuck on blocks in the run game. But I don't think there's an effort problem as a run defender like I think some people have pegged on him. But then he comes out and runs the 4 2 and I'm like, oh, he's fluid, sticky in coverage, and fast. Has that dog mentality as a corner. I think there's room to put a little bit of weight on him. He's only 20 years old, for God's sake. So I love that they, you know, didn't reach for that tackle need. Found a damn good player. Uh, I would have to go back and check, but I think would have been the best player on my board at the time. So got to give that an A. Granted, this team has taken some of these injury risk types of players, and uh, most recently with a guy like David Ojabo, it, it didn't work out. So there, there's a reason some of these guys can be available at this point. You got to consider that, uh, but still think he's well worth the, ris the risk. And I think he's more of a guy that he might just be a player, maybe like a Marlon Humphrey, where, okay, he gets banged up. He only plays 12 or 13 games a year, and you're just hoping he's there for the playoffs. I don't know that he's got, it's not like, you know, maybe, for example, someone we'll talk about later in this video with Peyton Wilson, where it's like he might not have an ACL. I think Nate Wiggins, it's like he's got to bulk, bulk up or he's going to get banged up. You know what I'm saying? Really, when you get to the 30th pick in the second round, this is where I am lower on the pick in Roger Rosengarten. Someone that got a lot of hype kind of later in the process. I watched him very early in the process. And of all the offensive linemen I watched, he might have had the biggest play strength concerns of anybody that I saw. Now his technique is great. He's a phenomenal athlete. He's tough. And you love all of those things about him. So this is a very clear cut evaluation in the sense of can he bulk up? And it seems the Ravens spending, you know, the, the, the back end of the second round pick on him. They believe he can. And I trust this organization to make that happen. Um, I would even imagine there might have been some conversations about a weight program and how to get him up to 310, 315 of real functional play strength. But the thing is, he's he is 311 pounds already, and he plays really light. So it's like, does he have that raw strength in him? I think that is going to determine the success of Roger Rosengarten because... He can move block. He's incredibly athletic. If he adds some play strength, he's going to be able to drive guys off the ball. Um, but that anchor and ability to kind of redirect guys in pass protection, that's my big question with him. I had him as an early day three type of prospect. They take him at the end of the second round. I think that's a pretty legitimate reach that I'm going to ding the Ravens for. Um, but again, if he can bulk up, this is a draft grade. We'll look back on it in a couple years and say, TFG, you're a freaking idiot. So I get it. Just earlier than I would have liked to take him, I had a good four or five tackles I liked better than him at this point. Um, then they take Adiza Isaac. So at the very end of the third round, 
which at that point for Adiza Isaac, he's going into the NFL to be exactly what I picture him to be. I really had issues with Adiza Isaac as a top 50 pick where he was getting projected as like a potential starter in the NFL. I really did not see that in Isaac's game. Now, I think he's a really good run defender and an okay pass rusher. And I think he's a he's a he's a good NFL athlete. He's not a great NFL athlete. So for me, he screams like a uh, Jonathan Cooper for Denver, for example. Or if you want to stay closer to home, maybe like uh, uh, Tyus Bowser. So I am going to give this an A because he eventually became a value at the end of the third round. If you can find a useful third guy for your edge room, as you maybe hope David Ojabo can recover, you get another step from Owe, you bring Kyle Van Noy back, you find another useful piece that can be a you know useful player. I hate to keep using that term, but that's kind of what I- Isaac is, is a 20, 25 snap innings eater for your edge group. This is around the range where that becomes a value. If you take that player in the second round, like the Saints taking an Isaiah Foskey last year or something like that, that's where I start to have issues with the investment. So I will go A with that grade. I just don't think he's like this crazy impact steal that you might see some people saying. I actually think getting Tez Walker in the middle of the fourth round is closer to that. I took some issues with second round hype on Tez Walker very early in the process, but that just entirely vanished. And I think he even fell down some NFL boards based on what he did at the Senior Bowl, where he couldn't catch a cold down there in Mobile, Alabama. It was brutal. Like, he just looked like he had the yips. And down the stretch at UNC, some of those drop issues showed up as well. Now, at a certain point, the guy does become a value because if he is what he is, which is a guy that can definitely get open over the top with 4-3 speed, a lengthy target with a large catch radius, you can be a little bit off target with this guy because he has the frame to adjust and make some really impressive catches down the field. But if he's going to be that with really bad drop issues where he might be wide open, but you don't know if he's going to catch it and he's Marquez Valdez Scantling, I think a fourth round pick for that player is is right on the money in terms of value and in this offense where you've got a bunch of short to intermediate targets. Not that Zay Flowers can't be a deep threat, but you want him working all over the field to just have that true deep threat to take the top off, open things up underneath a little bit for Lamar and Derrick Henry to do their thing in the run game. You know, if you can, you know, scare some teams with some Tez Walker deep shots early in the season, they're going to keep playing too high against you. Um, and and making sure they're shading towards Tez Walker with their deep safety, and it allows you to kind of, you know, game plan around that. So it's a very useful player for this offense, um, but there's also potential for him to hit the jugs machine, keep working on his hands, get better in that department. That's That can't be ruled out either, and if that happens, you're really talking a, about an impactful deep threat in the league. So I think that's a great pick in the fourth round, um, kind of on the back end of, of where I saw his value becoming a bit of a steal there in the fourth. And then uh, TJ Tampa, another guy was you, were, if you were looking at mock drafts, second round mock drafts, this is a name you were consistently seeing like to Arizona at like 34, um, you know, Tennessee at like 39, that those kind of teams. I always thought that was crazy. He didn't make my top 10 corners list. When I dropped that rankings video, everyone was like, where's TJ Tampa? Where's TJ Tampa? And I'm like, I just didn't see it. He's a big, clunky zone corner with good IQ and ball skills. That's a useful player, but I just did not see a starter in TJ Tampa. Like, absolute best-case scenario, he can become Rasul Douglas, but that's going to take time to develop that elite anticipation and that kind of stuff. Now, this is a very zone-heavy scheme in Baltimore. We've had to kind of rewire how we think about the Ravens secondary and the coverages they run because they were so like, you know, cover zero, man to man, uh, bump and run for so long. Now it's much more like eyes on the quarterback, trying to create confusion, running a bunch of different types of zone rotations, including a lot of cover two, where TJ Tampa is like, he couldn't have had a better name um, because he was born to play cover two, Tampa two. Um, and, And Baltimore will run a lot of that. So in this system with this coaching in a, in a cornerback room now where you've got Nate Wiggins, Lattimore ahead of you, Hamilton kind of occupies that slot corner spot. 
Uh, you know, Tampa is going to have to compete, but there are opportunities for him to rise the depth chart of guys like Brandon Stevens, who was okay last year. Jalen Armour Davis still hanging around. So once you get to the end of the fourth round, like, yeah, that's the back end of the range of where I saw Tampa going. I think it's a great scheme fit and, uh, you know, a potential starter down the road for them. But I think people are going to be like, oh, my God, how do they get TJ Tampa basically in the fifth round? And I'm like, it, it, the, the hype on him made no sense to me from the beginning. He was tied with six other players in terms of final grade for my 14th ranked corner in this draft. And he was around the best corner available at the time they took him. So I think it's a great pick, just not this like super steal that people might be saying out there. Uh, okay, they take Rasheen Ali in the fifth round. I I was not a huge Rasheen Ali guy. He's got good speed. He's got kind of good one cut slashing ability. I compared him to Darrington Evans, who's been kind of an RB3 in the league that's bounced around. I just thought there was much better running backs available, specifically Kamani Vidal, who ends up going to um, the Chargers. I think it's just going to be a much better, more useful all-around running back. But even if you wanted to go with this sort of slasher type, give me like a Blake Watson out of Memphis, who ended up going undrafted, so... Um, I don't know. I don't really think he's going to stick around too long in Baltimore. That's my kind of projection for him. I hope he surprises, but I just didn't see it. And then Devin Leary, okay, end of the sixth round, whatever, but why not Michael Pratt? I really don't understand that one. Leary might have a few more tools, but he's just not a good quarterback. Like Michael Pratt, who turned a two-lane program around, had pretty good tape, you know, pretty good play extender. I mean, as a Packers fan, I'm cool with this, uh, but I just I just don't get the Devin Leary pick, man, um, ahead of some of the guys that were available. And then they took a couple of guys uh, out of the Big Ten in the seventh round that I didn't get to. Nick Samak out of Michigan State. Never really going to argue with taking a Big Ten offensive lineman in the seventh round. It's usually about as good of a bet as you can find in general. And then um, uh, Sanelsi Kane, probably a special teamer out of Purdue, 30th pick in the seventh round okay that's you know fine whatever so i ended up going with a b grade on the baltimore ravens it's a good draft they had a lot of picks i think they're going to get some impactful players out of this i think nate wiggins is a potential superstar in the first round i think his raw coverage potential is even higher than like marlon humphrey which is obviously saying a lot roger rosengarden very wait and see for me don't think he can start for you at right tackle right away i think he would get manhandled like god forbid you have to put him against miles garrett for god's sake kiss that good night he could not hold up uh, in terms of play strength against him um but you know rotational you know third edge in adiza isaac a, a potential good deep threat in tez walker it, it's a good draft they had a lot of picks, though. I think they could have done even more. So, again, a B grade for the Baltimore Ravens. But then we get to the Cincinnati Bengals, starting with Amarius Mims. I'm going to give this the highest grade I'm giving here, an S for certified steal. And, you know, the steal element of that uh, typically indicates they're getting exceptional value with the pick. Um, and they are here. Mims was my 13th overall player. They get him here at 18. But there's some added context to the S grade. These are the picks I really want to highlight. Because if I think you got value, did a good job, it's a good fit, the guy's going to be a good player for you based on where you took him, I'm giving those A grades. I want to use these S grades to really put my foot down and be like, no, this is an incredible pick for this team. I think for the Bengals, who, because Joe Burrow got hurt, the season didn't go the way they expected, they get as high as the 18th pick in a really deep draft class, they get the rare opportunity for me to get a potential all-pro offensive tackle without having to go anywhere. You put that context together, that's like when the Bucks signed Tom Brady and they end up getting Tristan Wirfs in a deep tackle class with like the 12th pick or the 13th pick. I see a lot of parallels there. A little bit different players, but with Mims, you know... Talk about the perfect scheme fit and landing spot. The Bengals have made it very clear this is their type of tackle. They want the power guys for their gap-heavy, man, uh, man-centric man run scheme, head-up run scheme, not so much that Shanahan wide zone system that maybe we thought Zach Taylor was going to run and did run 
out the gate. They've completely revamped their running game, and Mims is a perfect fit for that. Not that he can't block wide zone. I think he can do that too. Um, but also as a pass protector where... You know, they've made it very clear, like, okay, Joe Burrow has perfect pocket footwork. He's always going to step up, allow tackles to seal that edge. If you have these bigger tackles that, in theory, maybe they're a little bit slower to protect that edge, though I don't necessarily think that's an issue for Mims because he's just such a super freak. But if that is going to be an issue, Joe Burrow will step up. You know, it's not like a lot of these young quarterbacks that will just keep drifting back, keep buying that angle for those guys to keep rushing upfield. Burrow has that perfect kind of Tom Brady-esque footwork. That's why, you know, Wirfs was so great with Tom Brady. There's a parallel there where it's like, just don't get pushed inside. Give me a pocket to step up in, and I will if I'm Joe Burrow. So in terms of the scheme fit, it's perfect. In terms of the guys he gets to learn behind that have developed and worked under this size profile with Trent Brown and Orlando Brown, Amarius Mims has some of the freakiest, if not the freakiest, athletic traits you'll ever see for a tackle prospect. I think he's falling to 18 because of, you know, the fact that he didn't play a lot of snaps in college, was behind NFL talent for his first two years, eventually became a part of a rotation in year two, the rare tackle rotation. He was just so good that Georgia had to find a way to get him on the field. Year three, he's starting at right tackle. I thought he actually looked great, but gets hurt, missed some time. I don't think he's a raw prospect. I think he's green. I don't see a whole lot of weaknesses in his game other than he's a little bit slow to recognize and anticipate inside pass rush counters where he needs to speed up his processing to step up and cut off inside moves. But he has the athletic twitch and, ch and change of direction to do that. So that was a lot of time spent on Amarius Mims, but... I wanted to give him his dues because I really think this is the rare opportunity for for Cincinnati to get, you know, a a Trent. I, I hate to say Trent Williams because he's that that good, but maybe like a a Tyron Smith for Joe Burrow, like that type of tackle, or a, a Penny Sewell. Like I think Amarius Mims can very much get into that discussion here in Cincinnati within. The first two years, he's not going to be a full-time starter right away, um, but I think that's perfectly fine. This is how the Bengals operate. This was one of my favorite picks in the entire draft. I, it really was. I'm a huge Mims guy. I really am, and I wanted to call my shot on that. Um, all right, let's let's move on. A lot of time on Mims there, but they take Chris Jenkins in the second round, middle of the second. Okay, it's fine. You know, I had him late second, early third. This is kind of on the very beginning of when I would have considered Chris Jenkins. To me. And this is another player I would stick my neck out, and, and that's why it's a B and not an A. I think the local kid, Michael Hall, who goes interdivision to Ohio, um, uh, uh, in Ohio to to Cleveland, uh, was a better pass rushing prospect um, that put on weight and has shown he's going to be a better run defender in the league. I'd rather bet on that as opposed to Chris Jenkins, who's a year older and has the run defense pedigree, but... Still needs to prove he can rush the passer. I would just go rather go the other way on a younger prospect. So slight criticism there. Still a good pick. Fine value. I'm going to give that pick a B. If I had to bet on it, I think he's a DT3 in the league. But he does have athletic tools if he can develop more of a pass rushing skill set to become something like a BJ Hill or something like that uh, long term for you. Um, and he doesn't have to start right away. They've got a couple starters there. And then Jermaine Burton in the middle of the third, it's kind of funny. He went smack dab in the middle of the third round because I had a second to a fourth round grade on Jermaine Burton. Really didn't know what to do with his off-field concerns, and he ends up landing smack dab in the middle of that range. So that definitely checks out for me. I will say I have really praised for a long time now the culture that the Cincinnati Bengals have established with Joe Burrow as the leader in that locker room. I think Zach Taylor does a really good job with the human elements of being a head coach. And with Jermaine Burton, the opportunity to be potentially Joe Burrow's number two wide receiver long term in this locker room is about as much motivation and leadership as you could ask for a guy with this type of talent that's just really immature off the field. And if he's willing to put his head down and work for the Bengals, you might see enough from him within this year to say, you know what, we can tag and trade T. Higgins after this year. We do have a legit number two opposite of Higgins. You know, I, I like Josh Yosivas. I like Charlie Jones. They don't have the potential 
to be what Jermaine Burton can be. His tape was easily top 50 players in this draft. Uh, gets open, gets open deep, catches everything. Really smooth, high-end athlete. It's just the coachability, staying out of trouble, you know, being mature and being a professional athlete, that's going to be the concerns with him. So I can't really question the value. Um, I will question the character. We'll see where it goes. Then you go McKinley Jackson at the very end of the third round. It was early for me. You know, a lot of defensive tackles had come off the board. I, I like the double dip strategy. I think he's... He is a developmental defensive tackle, just as I kind of view Chris Jenkins is, just because Chris Jenkins' pass rushing profile is so underdeveloped. So you get a pair of these guys to put kind of in the wings behind BJ Hill, behind Sheldon Rankins. He's got the traits. He's got some flashes. I liked his intensity at the Senior Bowl. I, you could definitely see the get off and, and he's well built. Like there's stuff to work with there. He is, the, you know, in this draft class, if you're a fourth year player, that's like he's young. A lot of these guys getting drafted are fifth and sixth year players. So he is only 22 years old. So I, I can see why they drafted him. They don't have a bunch of glaring needs, but they do look at the future of that defensive tackle room as a major problem. And I agree with them. So double dipping there. It's, it's fine. It's just a touch earlier than I would have liked him. I'm going to give that one a B. But then an interesting day three. Uh, so they take Eric All in the middle of the fourth round. Someone I talked about in the Fully Inflated Football Podcast when we broke down this tight end class as someone that has probably top five tape at tight ends for the guys in this draft, but major, major injury questions. So you're stacking him up. I mean, they, they did have a risky draft. They didn't. As much as I like Mims, there's some risk on his profile with the amount of time he's played and maybe durability just because he's a guy that he, you know, tackles that big do typically miss time. And he did in his final year at Georgia. So you kind of go down the board. It's like, OK, Mims got, um, you know, kind of a lot of stuff going on with his profile. Chris Jenkins got to develop the pass rushing. Jermaine Burton off field issues. McKinley Jackson entirely raw. And then they take Eric All who's this really high upside Iowa tight end. Not like that's ever worked out for anybody, um, but good tape, played at Michigan, had a bad back injury, had it surgically repaired in the offseason, goes to Iowa, looks good, uh, was an impact player for their offense, and then tears his ACL. So the durability for Eric All is extremely questionable. Um, but if you feel good about the medicals, I totally see him in the fourth round. That's fine. I ended up putting a fifth round grade on him just because I wasn't sure about the medicals, but they had more information than I did. So I think that's a good pick. They take Josh Newton in the fifth round. Uh, one of those guys that had a lot of hype coming into the year ended up disappointing. So you're gambling on the 2022 tape a little bit. Um, that's fine. Um, really like Tanner McLaughlin in the sixth round. I thought with some of the tight ends that were drafted in the second and third round last year, guys like Cole Strange, Cameron Latu, I ended up putting a third to a fourth round grade on Tanner McLaughlin because I was like, I mean, he's better than those guys were, and they went in the second, third round. So, you know, if I was being really honest about where I would draft Tanner McLaughlin, McLaughlin it probably would have been, you know, fifth round or so. I think what happened last year skewed my final grade on a lot of these tight ends a little bit this year. We didn't see those major reaches this time around. But that said, like, I really like Tanner McLaughlin in the fifth round. He's a really fluid, fast athlete for the tight end position, runs good routes, um, you know, comes down with some really tough catches on film, needs to improve his blocking. I don't know that he ever will, but this is a system, you know, they signed Mike Kosicki kind of to be their starting tight end they they like to go kind of shotgun spread where you can just put that guy out into the slot and kind of you know neutralize his blocking deficiencies like a, a bills can with a dalton knox or a chiefs can with a travis kelsey um, there's a certain system where it's easier to do that with these tight ends so i i like that aspect of it where if his blocking never comes along it might not be a huge problem for the bengals and they locked up cam sample if they want that inline player too. So they have some of that flexibility. I just like how they've approached this tight end room in the off season in general, they extended um, sample, but you know, you take a dart throw on Mike Kosicki who had to deal with the new England Patriots last year and was never a scheme fit when Mike McDonald took over in Miami. But before all that happened, he looked pretty promising as a receiving tight end. Uh, Eric all 
high risk profile, but well worth the risk in the fourth round. And then Tanner McLaughlin has a lot of traits to kind of bet on at this position. So you've got three guys in that room to compete. Um, and may the best man win, I think they have a good chance of walking out with an impact player between the three of those guys, uh, including Mike Kosicki. Um, then you take Cedric Johnson at the end of the sixth round. I mean, absolutely. Uh, kind of, I would imagine, just like I did, they had a similar grade on Cedric Johnson as they did on McKinley Jackson. They clearly had their eyes um, focused on the state of Mississippi this year because they took uh, three defensive players from Ole Miss and Mississippi State, but... I think just too good a value to pass up at the end of the sixth round. I, I don't know that I'll ever see Cedric Johnson as a starting edge in the league. He's just a little bit behind the eight ball, but he's got all the traits. He's got the get off and length profile and size and everything you look for as an eventual, you know, um, impactful third edge, kind of like we talked about with the Diza Isaac, where he can do a little bit of everything. If you can improve his run defense instincts and, and ability to kind of peek into the backfield and be a playmaker against the run. Um, you can get a really nice player there. If nothing else, just you know, true depth. If a guy's get uh, if a guy gets injured, so I, I like the value there. Um, and then a couple guys I didn't get to: Dijon Anthony, safety at Ole Miss, special teams, developmental depth, and then Matt Lee uh, out of Miami. I know a lot of people liked him, so it's worth noting that I didn't quite get around to his tape. Falls to the seventh round here. I think center depth uh, is is right um, on par for for him, in my opinion. So. I did really like what the Bengals did. A couple of those day two picks, I probably would have gone in a different direction um, with guys like Jenkins and McKinley Jackson, but I just, I really wanted to plant my flag on the Amarius Mims pick. Um, being one we look back on in a few years and being like, yeah, that's going to be an absolute steal at 18, given the fact that it's a valuable tackle position. I think he could be an all pro for this team, a team that doesn't have any plans of picking in the top 10 again. So I love that swing. And then Burton, I'm kind of a fan of the risk given they have they have the luxury of having a culture where a player like that could hit. So, And they, they might end up with a starting tight end as well between Eric All and Tanner McLaughlin. So got to go A-minus with this draft for the Cincinnati Bengals. That said, you know, there, we, as we mentioned, there's some risky aspects to this draft. Um, but I'm not necessarily opposed to the risks, the specific risks that they took. I think they all made sense. Then we get to the Cleveland Browns, uh, who took Michael Hall uh, towards the back end of the second round. Now, I recognize I am higher on Michael Hall than a lot of people, but what I didn't hear people mentioning, you know, everybody slammed him for being a bad run defender and only being a pass rushing specialist. I didn't hear anybody bring up the fact that he added almost 20 pounds in the offseason. And I thought he did show flashes of run defense at Ohio State. Now, if someone was down blocking on him or double teaming, of course, at 280 pounds, playing a two eye at Ohio State like they asked him to do, he's going to give up a lot of ground. But he's put on 20 pounds since he's left Ohio State, who's always had that spot on their D-line for that splashy 280 pound uh, interior rusher, Draymond Jones, just Sean Cornell. I think Michael Hall got out of Ohio State and he's like, I'm so much more and will be so much more than just a third down pass rusher on the interior. But even if he is just a third down pass rusher on the interior, I think he's a really, really effing good one. Lightning quick feet. He still tested incredibly well after putting on 20 pounds. So I love that. Um, but lightning quick feet. He actually was the only player that I saw push Jackson Powers Johnson back at the Senior Bowl. I think he's got an underrated power profile because he's got the length, he's got good core strength, and he's got a really good first step. He actually has that ability to package his lower half and his upper half to generate a bull rush. I think that's only going to get better. My pro count for Michael Hall was Justin Matabuike, who Browns fans are obviously familiar with. But I think he's even further ahead of the learning curve than Matabuike was coming out, who was even more raw. But in terms of the size and the profile, I see a very similar player. And Matabuike is a, a solid run defender and a, and a great pass rusher at this point. In in you know he broke out in his final year, so love 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 this pick. Was a ring the bell moment for me because I said like, look man, people think he's a third or a fourth round prospect for the most part. I'm like, no man, this is a, this is a top fifty or so player in this draft. And I am going to grade this one as a certified steal. I think they benefited from multiple defensive tackles getting picked ahead of them that I think Michael Hall will end up being better than. So I'm going to call my shot on that one. You know, the S could stand for 
just the S grade, which in a lot of, you know, tiering systems is like one step above an A. It could stand for steel or it could stand for S for stomping my foot and saying, no, this is a specific pick that I think we'll look back on in a couple years as as a phenomenal draft pick, a, a kind of, I don't want to say a, a franchise altering draft, but like, you know, it, it you get the point. Like that's that's what we're using this S grade for. And I definitely feel that way about Michael Hall where there were a bunch of other defensive tackles that I think shouldn't have gone before him. Ruka Rororo, where the Falcons traded up. Um, Braden Fisk, we just talked about Chris Jenkins went before him. You could argue Tavondre Swift with with his off-field concerns. That, that's a whole different conversation, but um, other teams went in a different direction. I think the Browns uh, got lucky by that, whether they felt like Michael Hall was better than those guys or not. I'm going to sit here and, and plant my flag that... Um, you know they got the steal out of that out of that run of, of defensive tackles that we saw there, and by the way, that's without even mentioning he gets to be a part of this defensive line where hell in year one he can just be a rotational pass rusher. They have interior pieces. They have guys like Dalvin Tomlinson, Shelby Harris, Maurice Hurst, all very good run defenders. Obviously, that deep rotational pass rush that they have going on. I mean, Michael Hall probably won't play a ton in year one because of how deep that group is, but all of those interior pieces are not long-term plans. They even signed um, Quentin Jefferson, who's like the, you know, prototype rotational pass rush specialist. So uh, again, he probably won't make me look right in year one, but year two, year three, Look for that boom from Michael Hall Jr. who gets to stay in state. There's just so many things to love about this pick. Um, And then they go Zach Zinter in the middle to end of the third round. I did have a second to a third round grade on Zinter, even with those injury concerns. I saw starting guard in the league, the way he kind of puts guys in the dirt when they pulled him reminded me a lot of Wyatt Teller. So there you go. I think this is your long-term replacement guard eventually this team's going to run into some contract issues i know they've been doing a great job with the cap and extending guys and and continuing to build this roster up but the bill will come due eventually and could one of those veteran guards be a piece they look to save some money and plug a zach zinter in is i don't want to say a seamless transition because that's a pair of kind of pro bowl guards there that's hefty hefty expectations um, but as a quality starter a guy that if, if he wasn't coming off that broken leg and got to finish the playoffs and, and maybe participate in the senior bowl, like maybe would have been more of a top 50 or a second round pick. So I think they stole some value there, um, but he's going to be ready, right? That, that leg will be ready to go, but they don't need it to be either. So really like that pick for, for Zach Zinter in the third, you get to day three. They don't make a pick until the middle of the fifth. They go Jamari thrash. I think it's a good fit, right? Like, he's a route runner type. He creates a lot of separation. Not the most incredible hands or or the biggest guy or anything like that. But you you put him in a room with Jerry Judy, Amari Cooper. Uh, Obviously, Cooper is a bigger guy. Judy a little bit more Jamari Thrash's size. Uh, But as a backup to those two players specifically makes a lot of sense. If one of those guys goes down, um, I think you're, you're able to put in Thrash and um do a lot of the same stuff ironically my high-end comp on thrash was jerry judy i liked him as a late third early fourth rounder so i do think there's starter potential in there obviously you see what they like in him there with that judy comp so to get him at the end of the fifth i thought was a really great value nathaniel watson i thought was a good pick in the at the end of the sixth round Uh, he was up there in terms of my favorite sort of mid to late day three linebacker prospects not gonna wow you with the traits but a guy that played a lot of football in the SEC. And and one thing that you can really write home about him is he does not have the same tackling issues that a lot of these day three linebackers do. He had one of the best missed tackle uh, rates of all the linebackers in this draft. I think he was second behind Junior Colson. So he did have a trait to write home about compared to a lot of the linebackers going in this range. Love the Miles Harden pick. In the seventh round, scrappy kind of off zone corner at South Dakota State, uh, South Dakota, not even South Dakota State. Um, But I think he projects best as a slot. Really good special teams depth. Small school guy that's going to compete his ass off. He's got a great first step, though, and I think does have starting slot potential. Again, 
Um, look, you know, it's a seventh round pick. You're not expecting that, but uh, that cornerback room in theory is going to get very expensive at one of these days. Uh, could he be an out for one of those guys? Maybe. Um, and then Jawan Briggs staying in state uh, with some defensive tackle depth out of Cincinnati. So love the Browns draft. I think for what they had, they, they nailed this draft. Going to give them an A grade on this one. All right, then we got the Pittsburgh Steelers to wrap up the AFC North. Definitely one of the best drafts of the weekend. Uh, Troy Fatanu at 20 for a very similar reason to what we broke down with Amarius Mims. I'm going to go with a steal, an S grade on this one, um, though it's a little bit different. I don't think Fatanu necessarily has the upside of an Amarius Mims in terms of the traits and the potential to be like a Tyron Smith or anything like that. But I do think within this system, you're basically taking Fatanu's one main weakness in that he doesn't have a lot of body mass and if you were to put him in more of a head up blocking scheme maybe like a Cincinnati I would have some questions about the run blocking with him in that type of a system and you might be you know you might be saying well what are you talking about this is the Pittsburgh Steelers that's what they do not anymore they brought in Arthur Smith who runs more wide zone than anybody in the league and it's I don't even know if it's going to be particularly close at this point with a lot of those Shanahan inspired teams getting to a lot more gap stuff so with Fatanu incredible move athlete I think if you want him to block wide zone he's actually going to be an excellent run blocker um, so for the scheme fit there I love it and just as a pass protector, he's incredibly high floor. I think in most draft classes, he's a top 10 pick. Like, he's a better prospect than, for example, like the Bears took last year, Darnell Wright at the 10 spot. I think Fatan is a much better tackle prospect than that, especially in terms of pass protection. So for him to fall into their lap at 20, love that. And then after that, they go Zach Frazier at pick 51, which for me is like probably absolutely as early as i was considering him like when i was doing my mock drafts based on where i had him graded look i'm, I'm just here to tell you what i think about these prospects i was lower on zach frazier i really did not get behind the top 50 hype on him he goes 51 here so it's like okay i don't think he's a top 50 player any point after that sure you want you want to draft him to be your starting center i'm cool with it literally pick 51 they do it so <laughs> um still like at the earliest of early ranges where I think you could take him. Not going to complain about getting a starting center, though. Now, a main reason as well that I think this is a B is room for interpretation with scheme fits. I actually have some criticisms with Zach Frazier as a wide zone blocking center for Arthur Smith. Zach Frazier, to me, feels like a good center for the previous regime. But you look at the centers that Arthur Smith has had in Atlanta. Matt Hennessy, Drew Dahlman these freaky move blockers that if a team's going to run an even front on you and you have to reach a two tech that's up in front of the guard someone that can fly out of their stance open up that bucket step and reach that guy i really actually don't think zach frazier's good at that like at all i think he's very clunky when he has to open up and get on the move he's very good in a phone booth um, but I actually have some questions in terms of how good of a run blocker he's going to be in this system for them. That will be interesting to follow through the years. Pass protection, though, really no questions. He's he's a, kind of a rock in that terms. Although I did see him give up some ground against bull rushes if left one on one. So even then, it's like I, I just I, overall, I, I want to reiterate, like I I don't know that this was some super steal for the Steelers in the second round. Not to say it wasn't a good pick. And I like the overall philosophy of investing in the offensive line and being like, this is not going to be a problem again. Like, you think back to the Killer B days, that offensive line, yes, they had those superstars, um, but you remember, like, Le'Veon Bell had, like, three seconds to let blocks play out because these guys were constantly just letting blocks develop and moving guys off the line, like, just always in unison. They've gotten so far away from that over the last few years. I love the investments here, and they made another one um, a couple picks later. Um, but you get to the third round, they go with Roman Wilson, ideal kind of player for what they needed they have a bazillion vertical threats on this offense in this roster they really do um obviously they have pickens good outside wide receiver but even even beyond that you know van jefferson quez watkins calvin austin denzel mims even all the way down to like des fitzpatrick marquez callaway 
I was really blown away looking at this depth chart. Like, wow, literally everybody they have is just a straight line vertical threat. Um, and then even I think you could say George Pickens a little bit of that, um, though he's a little more versatile, you know, to work the boundary and that kind of stuff. But um, Roman Wilson gives you the piece that they don't have there. Someone that can actually line up in the slot. Someone that provides some better speed on like crossing routes as well. It's going to be a great fit in this Arthur Smith offense. He is an undersized slot, but he actually run blocks like for that reason. Arthur Smith's going to like him more than a guy like Deontay Johnson that just doesn't really have any interest in run blocking. It's a big priority for, for Arthur Smith. So he, they're going to love that aspect of him. You'll see him even like down blocking on like smaller linebackers. And you're like, okay, Roman Wilson, he does not get care. Uh, he does not care um, if he's the smaller man. So they're going to love him. It made a ton of sense. Uh, you know, Again, a pick that everyone's going to be like, oh my God, they got Roman Wilson in the third round. How did they do that? He was in the top 50 of mock drafts. I saw him as a third round guy, as a slot only wide receiver in a very deep draft class. Um, I was afraid he was going to get overdrafted ahead of some other really good receivers. That didn't really end up happening. He was definitely in the running for best wide receiver available at this point, especially for what they needed. So excellent pick there. And then Peyton Wilson, look, at the end of the third round, I have my questions on Peyton Wilson. Not even so much the durability stuff, though I think that's why he slid here. Um, something to note there. But I, I, I had my issues with his run defense and ability to step in as a 24-year-old linebacker and you know play middle linebacker out the gate. He does not have take on strength as a blocker. He's incredibly light. He reminded me a lot of Drew Sanders coming out last year, where I still think he needs time, but you can put him out there on third downs if you want. Let him rush the passer, where he did a lot of that at NC State, rushing off the edge. That's another reason I think he needs more time to develop, because he just hasn't played a ton of true middle linebacker at NC State, even though he's been there for six years. But where he really popped on film was that range in coverage, where he's got this long frame, a truly special athlete, legitimately moves faster and more fluid than a lot of high-end safeties in this draft class and he does that at you know 6'4 230 pounds so a unique specimen and I like the fit here because you do have a a perfect linebacker to be ahead of Peyton Wilson for what we just described in a Landon Roberts who's like the opposite where he's a he's a run stuffing stiffer early down linebacker so they could actually be very smart about this and and even with Peyton Wilson's durability concerns, if you just want him in a linebacker rotation like that to do later down work, I actually think that's fine. Like you rotate slot corners and all that stuff on and off the field. You can totally get your linebacker rotation as a part of like, uh, you know, defense by package type of stuff. So you can get to third and eight, say, all right, Roberts, you're out. Peyton Wilson, you're in. That's very manageable for me. Would you prefer to have the true third down linebacker? Yeah, um, ideally. Um, but maybe you hope Peyton Wilson in time can become that and you build you work around it for now. So I think it's a really good fit in the room with this coaching. Makes a ton of sense to me. The sideline to sideline speed between Patrick Queen and Peyton Wilson is really phenomenal. Hope he can stay healthy. You know, we really praised them for going Corey Trice in the seventh round last year. It turns out he had major injury concerns, couldn't really get on the field. So there's a reason for the fall. We'll see if he can stay healthy. But, man, Mason McCormick in the fourth round, are you kidding me? I had a second to a third round grade on him. I thought there were so many other offensive linemen that were drafted ahead of him that were not as good of prospects. It, hell, even including Zach Frazier, I actually liked Mc Mason McCormick better because I think he's just more powerful, better athleticism, and, yeah, he played at a lower level of competition, but I thought he was a more dominant blocker overall had those tools to really assert himself much more often than a guy like Frazier. So, um, you know, maybe that level of competition transition, some of the pass work, um, pass blocking stuff, um, not quite where it needs to be yet. But for me, you get a starting interior offensive lineman with really high upside in the like middle to end of the fourth round. That is a certified steal for me. There was a lot of picks that happened before him where I was like, why are you not taking Mason McCormick? And between these three picks and Broderick Jones, who they took in the first round last year, this could really turn into a very, very special, special group. I'm a huge fan of how they've rebuilt this line. Um, it's something I'm always looking to prioritize. 
in my own personal team building philosophy, and it's really good to see the Steelers kind of get back to that because they went years there where I was like, man, this whole line needed some work. Like, remember they took Najee Harris and people wanted offensive line. Like, they're getting back to their roots a little bit. And I love that. Um, and then even like Logan Lee in the sixth round. I struggled when we had EJ Schneider on and we had a name like a day three my guy for defensive tackles. Logan Lee was the name I came up with just because I think he's going to be a useful player. And I love him in this scheme. Like Pittsburgh has always had these uh, high energy, undersized kind of four eyes um, for their kind of odd fronts. They've been just spamming guys like Isaiah Loudermilk. They signed Dean Lowry. They drafted DeMarvin Leal. They haven't gotten anything from him yet. But, you know, those guys are all in this similar kind of breath. Um, I like Logan Lee to maybe be the best out of that crop. A really nice swim move that he uses not just as a pass rusher, but as a run defender to slip off blocks. He's got great length. Uh, he has really good effort and eyes against the run. It's just he is 290 pounds. He's a little bit of a tweener. Uh, you have to put him in the specific situation that the Pittsburgh Steelers will so that he doesn't get demolished against the run. But um, I like adding some of that interior D-line depth with Logan Lee. Never going to be a superstar, I don't think, but definitely a guy that I think can kind of carve out a little bit of lore with Steelers fans, where he's around for a long time, and um, Steelers fans uh, are thankful that you have him. Uh, And then Ryan Watts is a very interesting pick in the middle of the sixth round, just a true developmental safety convert. Played outside corner at Texas, really struggled. Um, but a bigger guy, 6'3", north of 200 pounds, good tackler, good tackling consistent uh, consistency, uh, tested really well. So you're looking at the traits and the tackling and say, okay, you play special teams, we're going to move you to safety. You can learn from Patrick Peterson, who just made that transition. Uh, we'll see where he's at in a few years. So I think it's a good process to put him in the room there. Ultimately, got to give the Pittsburgh Steelers an A grade back-to-back years where I think the Pittsburgh Steelers have absolutely killed it and – they're really setting this roster back up now where like you're now like you got to get that quarterback position right but minus the quarterback it it keeps getting better and better where it's one of the better rosters in the league especially now that offensive line is looking a lot better is, is the main focal point there um so there's your AFC North Thank you so much, you guys, for watching. Let me know in the comments down below. Where do you think I'm crazy? What players did you love that maybe I didn't like or vice versa? Uh, Please do hit that like button as well on the way out. We are going to go eastward next. We're going to do the NFC East next. Not sure if I'm going to be able to record that here today on Tuesday with the roofers coming, um, but we'll see you as soon as possible. Thank you. Peace out.